Good evening. My name is Rebecca Fox, and I'm a student project manager at the Clark Forum for Contemporary Issues at Dickinson College. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that Dickinson College is on the unceded lands of the Susquehannock Nation. We acknowledge the many indigenous peoples that lived with these lands, as well as the thousands of indigenous children forced into the Carlisle Indian Industrial School in 1879 as part of a federal cultural eradication effort. On behalf of the Clark Forum and the departments of English, Latin American, Latinx, and Caribbean Studies, the Creative Writing Program, and the Women's and Gender Resource Center, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's program, No Ruin Stone, a reading and conversation with Shara McCollum. You saturate the sight of those who came after, poets and painters alike. Your words invade my mind's listening, manacle my tongue when I try to speak on all I backward cast my eye and fear and cannot see. Who would I have been to you? What stone in the ruined house of the past? This beginning entry to Shara McCollum's No Ruined Stone is a narrator speaking to one of the world's renowned poets, Robert Burns, but I found myself reading it and feeling moved by the way the words could relate to any of the artistic heroes I personally hold dear. Poetry is not my chosen medium. I tend to create visual art rich with texture, details, and emotion. However, a good poem will grab a reader and make you feel as though you're standing in front of a six foot tall oil painting with a thousand brush strokes complete with intricate details for you to unpack if you give it the time. Narrative poems are perhaps even more suited to this painting metaphor as they'll show a wide picture of a scene where the details within it give the audience more information about the intention and meaning of an overall story. Shara McCollum is the award-winning author of the books No Ruined Stone, Mad Woman, La Historia es un Cuerto, History is a Room, and The Water Between Us. Born to a Jamaican father and Venezuelan mother, McCallum has a personal connection with Caribbean culture and language. Her books have been translated into Spanish, Italian, French, Romanian, Turkish, and Dutch. She has been recognized by the Jamaican government with the OCM Bocas Prize for Caribbean Literature, as well as a Witter Biner Fellowship from the US Library of Congress, as well as a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship in Poetry. Adrian Sue, who will be in conversation with Sharon McCollum, is a professor of creative writing at Dickinson College. She is the author of multiple books, the recipient of a National Endowment for the Arts Prize, and the current poet in residence at Dickinson College. There will be a question and answer session immediately following the program tonight, so please hold all questions until that time. The Clark Forum welcomes differences of opinion expressed politely, thoughtfully, and succinctly. Disruptive behavior or harassment of the speakers, members of the Dickinson community, or audience members will not be tolerated. As a show of respect for our speakers and everyone in attendance, please stay until the end of the program, including the question and answer session. At this time, I ask you please silence all cell phones and other electronic devices. In the event of an emergency, please know that the handicapped accessible exits are located on the west side of the building. And now, please join me in welcoming our guests, Professor Sharon McCollum and Professor Adrian Sue. Okay, perfect, because I ripped the microphone off walking up here. <laughs> so, Rebecca, thank you so much for the gorgeous introduction. Mark, thank you for inviting me and everybody affiliated with the Clark Forum and Dickinson for having me here. Um, many thank yous to all of you who've come here tonight in lieu of the many other things that you could be doing, including watching Squid Games. So, <laughs> I so appreciate your kind attention. Um, Adrian and I are gonna have a conversation through poetry. Um, and I thought I would start with actually the poem that Rebecca led with. Mm -hmm. So I'll begin there, and then we will go back and forth, and you'll hear poems scattered throughout the conversation. No Ruined Stone. You saturate the sight of those who come after, poets 
and painters alike. Your words invade my mind's listening, manacle my tongue when I try to speak. On all, I backward cast my eye and fear and cannot see. Who would I have been to you? What stone in the ruined house of the past? In this world, I am unloosed, belonging to no country, no tribe, no clan, not African, not Scotland. And you, voice that stalks my waking and dreaming, you more myth than man cannot unmake history. So why am I here resurrecting you to speak when your silence gulfs centuries? Why do I find myself on your doorstep knocking when I know the dead will never answer? I love that you begun the reading with the first poem in the book and that the first poem in the book works in tandem with the last poem in the book, which has the same title. They're also the only two poems in this whole collection that are spoken by, apparently, Shara McCallum. Yes. <laughs> uh, so in between, we have a number of speakers, mm -hmm. um, but two main speakers. Mm -hmm. uh, Robert Burns, in a life he might have lived, and his fictional granddaughter, Isabella. Um, so maybe I'll just start by asking you a question, and then maybe that will lead into another poem. Yes. Um, I found that I while I was reading, I could feel kind of Burns turning into McCallum, turning back into Burns, and the same thing happened with Isabella, that mm -hmm. the, you know, the poet that is you is also kind of speaking as the poet that is Burns, and Isabella kind of becomes a poet to me because of you. Um, so I wonder about the writing process for such an absorbing collection that work, works more like a novel than most poetry collections do. Could you talk about how you wrote these sections? Did you spend a lot of time in one voice, or did you just move back and forth between speakers? Hmm. So I really appreciated the conversation that we had with your class this morning. It feels like a long time ago now. I see some of you all here. Hello, beautiful students. Um, and so forgive me that I think you've heard some of this before, but I will just quickly say um, what I said there, which is that Isabella is whose voice I could hear first. I worked on this book in terms of the research for it for three years before I started to write the poems in earnest. So lots of note taking, lots of reading, travels to archives, which I'd be very happy to talk more about if you're interested in that. Um, and I heard a voice speaking to me and I did not even know who she was. And so Isabella's section was not what I meant to write, actually. I meant to put Burns in Jamaica. Um, the almost history that, that Adrian is referring to is that Burns came very close to sailing from Scotland to Port Antonio, Jamaica. He would actually have gone via Kingston, um, which is where I am from. And he booked passage three times. He had signed on to work as a bookkeeper on a slave plantation owned by two brothers from the same part of Scotland he hails from. Um, I say three times that he booked that passage and canceled it, so you understand this was not a passing fancy. Um, and I was really struck by that in trying to find my way to articulating what would have happened. I thought I was going to only cast the characters in those 10 years, 1786 to 1796 when he died. Mm -hmm. But Isabella was speaking out of a very different location, time period, and it really was her voice that birthed her in my ear. So 
that's the answer, truthfully, to the question is that she came first. She insisted on this book, including her. She has the last say, other than me. She, she really has the last word. She picks up Burns' language. You're right, she's a poet because she's constantly recasting his words. So she's using irony a lot. She's using illusion a lot. Um, these tropes that poets and writers use. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the, the magic, I think, of writing a book of poems is that something does, or even just writing a single poem, is that something presents itself to you. Well, that's the hope that, that it will happen. <laughs> um, but you never know when that's going to happen or what you're supposed to do to get that to happen. Were there any sort of moments that just kind of felt granted to you in the process? I mean, I feel like the appearance of Isabella is the biggest one. Yeah, well, I mean, that first poem you just heard, um, that was one of those moments. So mm -hmm. after I did this research, and I had already been to Scotland, Callum Colvin is a Scottish photographer. He does installation work. You can look him up online. It's his work that's on the cover of this book. I met Callum in 2016 because of this book. Met many people because of this book. Um, he has worked tirelessly with Scottish history, myth, culture, and we're working in really different mediums in the way Rebecca was speaking to, but both of us deeply interested in sites of history and reinterrogations of those. He has also worked on Burns and loves poetry and how poets in Scotland in particular deal with Scottish history. So he invited me in 2018, after we had, you know, I'd met him a couple times, corresponded, mm -hmm. um, to participate in an installation he curated at the Royal Academy of Scottish Art and Architecture in Edinburgh. I was the only poet, five poets, to respond to the art in the installation of that room, the rooms in the academy that he curated. I was the only one to come from Jamaica and America, not Scotland. So I was really honored by that. Um, and I also was not able to get there until the exhibit began. So I went over, and after all those years of research, not writing anything, said, I have to do this. I'm going to sequester myself for two weeks in Edinburgh, go and do this installation thing for, with Callum, and come up with something to say. This is the first poem in the book, and it wrote itself in May 2018, and I wrote one third of the book in 12 days, in May of 2018. So that's how strange things happen sometimes. That doesn't mean I was just waiting, though, for three years. Active waiting is what's required, not passive waiting, right? So doing the research, thinking through the problems, um, and then it feels as if, like when we say we have intuition, I think we just have memory of what we've already learned and we forgot that we knew it. And so I think that's how that kind of process for me worked. Mm -hmm. You know, the gift of that poem. Um, just so you know, Callum's portrait is of Hugh MacDiarmid. And Hugh MacDiarmid, well-known, does anybody know who he is by chance? Well-known Scottish poet, also like Burns, who worked in English and vernacular, so Scots language. Uh, 20th century, very influential, very cantankerous figure. And um, his epigraph is, uh, the, his, his a line from one of his poems is the epigraph for this book. So, so many gifts happened. The portrait of Hugh MacDiarmid has Robert Burns in his pupil that, that Callum created. I could not see that when Callum sent me the image until I stood in front of it. And when I was standing in front of it, Callum told me the poem by Hugh MacDiarmid, there was a picture right next to this of stones, right? So all of these things that just all of a sudden, and the, it, the line from MacDiarmid is, there are plenty of ruined buildings in, this, in the world, but no ruined stones. Yeah, so all of it like clicks, right? When you've done the active waiting, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and Another thing that I imagine happened organically is the symmetry of the book as you have constructed it. Yeah. Uh, Robert and Isabella have a number of poems with the same title. Mm -hmm. And I figure that that's somewhat planned, but it's also something that probably also happened. 
Yeah, I can't speak to that, so I'm going to read two poems instead. Okay. <laughs> All right. This is you, Mark, from dinner, telling me when you don't have the answer to the question, just read the poem. <laughs> it's not exactly what you said, but that was what I took from it. So, uh, this Springbank is the name of the, the, the great house at the plantation. If you don't know the structure of plantation slavery, the great house is where the master would have lived. And then the overseers, the bookkeepers, would have been overseeing the work of the enslaved Africans, would have had like cottages. And then there were slave quarters at the periphery, most often in these plantations. So this is Springbank. This is the last poem in Burns' section. And this is when he is dying. It's the last one he writes before he dies. A lot happens in his section. Let me not recount that now. Let me just read the poem. But he's referencing the first time he sees Springbank 10 years before. Springbank, place of memory now in ruin. This point overlooking the sea, this cliff, this perch, paradise to none but one who came imagining he could be lord, could be unmoored from class and caste. The way past is always the way through. After sea, over land, we traversed mountain. Rocky passages flanking us, abutted by gullies. Oversized plants casting their shadows. The horses' hooves trod and trod until stone gave way to field. And we entered the valley, approaching the great house from behind. That first sight rises still in my mind, bodying forth false promise. Look twice or you leap once. Echoes now fruitless. Oh, what foolishness lies in the heart of man. Gleaming wish to be more that waits for its chance to pounce and savage. So that's Burns and his spring bank. Time elapses, Burns dies. You need to know this before I read Isabella's, her genealogy. There's even a genealogical chart that I included in the book. Um, Burns has a relationship with an enslaved African woman named Nancy. They birth a child and that child is in childhood when Burns dies. She grows up a mulatta on that plantation. She is raped by Douglas, who is decades older than her, the master of the plantation. The product of that rape is Isabella. So her grandfathers are both Scotsmen, right? Um, and that's important to keep in mind. And um, Isabella, when her section of the book opens, she's born in 1806. Quick refresher on slavery in the British West Indies. It doesn't end until 1833. Isabella is born looking white, but being enslaved and black. You need to understand that part too. This is her story um, of Springbank. Did I mention her mother died in childbirth? I forget if I mentioned that detail. Yeah, so her grandmother raises her. Springbank was all the world I'd known. A child there, I was hers, Miss Nancy's kin. No matter this skin, these eyes belonging to his face. Your father could not look at you without seeing disgrace was the only answer she'd relent to offer. Even when her life waned, she would not unlock the past. Tell me what she'd said that made him let us go. Why he paid and paid to send us away and away. We left first for Kingston, 
and a door closed behind us, a door I was never meant to open again. In Kingston, my grandmother was passed off as my slave. By the time our ship docked in Greenock, she was my servant, and we threaded into a tale so tightly woven, no one would guess my origin. What she sacrificed was everything of herself to see me freed. But my father, you kent him and his world so intimately, what I've surmised will be no surprise. What Douglas understood was expedience. I was simply evidence. I needed to be erased. So those are two of the partner poems. There are many others, um, and that's just because they are echoing each other across centuries. Um, as I feel that this book and the story and voices in it have been echoing across centuries so that I could hear them, basically. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, that was, I think that was a great sort of introduction to the parallel stories that, mm -hmm. because there is some context people need, I think, to. Yeah. Um, and if you're confused, just raise your hand and I can clarify. So uh, she has, I realize I even said grandfathers. Yes, both her grandfathers are Scottish, but the point is her father is the, Douglas, who's the, the slave owner and master of the plantation. That's the really crucial piece. And her paterfamilias of Burns, when she gets to Scotland, his name is now in death, just what it's become. In the real Burns' life, by the way, he ha enjoyed the experience most poets do not. He was really wildly famous in his short lifetime. The reason scholars speculate he did not get on that ship wasn't for moral reasons. It was because his first book, the first printing of it, sold so quickly and well that he was able to forestall going. There were a lot of circumstances he was running from, basically, in Scotland, and one of them was financial ruin that he was trying to extricate himself from. So see, there is a tie into Squid Games, after all. <laughs> um, and I think the choices that people make when their back is up against the wall are very fascinating to me to consider in this work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you've made me think, one thing that, I think the first time I read the book, I didn't, I wasn't looking, I wasn't looking at the overarching correspondences. I was just kind of reading poem by book poem. And the, one of the things I find so remarkable is that when I read Burns' poem, Voyage, which is near the beginning of his mm -hmm. section and shows him um, on the ship to yeah. Jamaica, um, just knowing the premise of the book, I couldn't help but think about enslaved Africans on the Middle Passage, which of course is not on his mind at all. He's just feeling seasick. He's weak in general. Um, and what the book delivers later is Isabella's Voyage. Voyage. Um, I don't know, would you be inclined maybe to read those two? Sure. I like this. Uh, Adrian and I are doing this as we go along. And I like it because um, it means that the, the shape of this is like no other. And I like that about readings in person. So Voyage is the first uh, early poem, actually. He has the departing poem of Aphon Kiss, which also repeats, Mrs. Burns speaking. Life itself became disease aboard the bell. Passage to Jamaica, first landing in Kingston. My illness at sea gave way to a greater unhinging. The period they call here the seasoning. For weeks, I was adrift, mind fretted with fevers, body racked with chills afflicting even the strongest who breach these shores. Brother, I was counted dead, then nearly dead. 
when we arrived and for many a time after. I was nine parts, nine tenths out of ten, stark staring mad. Madness is something that runs throughout this book as well and has many connotations. It's been sort of an obsession of mine, I think, really. This is Isabella, and this is interesting to think about because this is the last time she speaks. And the choice, as I spoke with the students about earlier, that she's faced is whether or not her grandmother has died. She's grieving her grandmother. And when her grandmother dies, the only person who knows who she actually is exits the world at that point. Her famous grandfather, she can't claim him because that will give up her ruse. Douglas' family wants nothing to do with her. And um, she's married to a white Scotsman, and he doesn't know he's married to a black woman. So she's really struggling throughout with what to choose. She makes that choice, and as the beautiful readers in Adrian's class firmly established, she does decide she will not keep passing. So I'm spoiling the book, but I hope you'll still read it if you're interested in seeing how it unfolds. But you sort of need to know that to hear Voyage. Mm -hmm. um, this book also deliberately is dealing with, of course, the history of the Middle Passage throughout Voyage. For days, our ship had listed in storms, but at last, the waters stilled. In the middle of our crossing, came a calm, and the sea, a sheet of glass, reflected only moon and stars and cloudless sky, as if all that was before and all that was to come was dream. Above and below us lay two firmaments, and we, marooned by history, by memory, became the between. In the wake of tempest, the sea offered faint reckoning, wave upon wave, dimly echoing, winds lashing of rope to mast, as that night splintered into every night, and the stars numberless as the souls lost to the sea's depths, revealed the routes we would have to take to recover the wreckage of ourselves. I'll stop and let you talk again, Adrian. I like right. this. <laughs> That's great. Um, yeah, I, I think part of what for me, it makes this book so wonderful to just kind of live with. And I've had the privilege of living with it longer than it's been officially out. Mm -hmm. Gave me a sneak peek. Um, is that it takes a kind of oblique look at some pretty weighty issues. Um, slavery, obviously. Um, just the circumstances that everyone at Springbank lives under. Um, the, well, race, right? As just a problem humans have created over time. Um, but the poems are often coming at it from a kind of sneaky angle. And I think that's part of its power. I feel that there's a lot of inclusion and also deliberate omission going on throughout the collection, which is part of why I feel like it's, it's a novel in so many fewer words than most novels, <laughs> uh, that it's truly uh, compressed, rewards rereading, yielding layer upon layer. But I wonder, how did you know? Like, how did you decide? Did you have things that were more direct that you took out, or did the issues, so to speak, just kind of show up on their own when you weren't really meaning to address them? Or was it something else? That's a really excellent question. Um, anything I'm saying, of course, is narrative, which means that it's after the fact of I've written it. So it's kind of a construction, like memory always is. 
And to be honest, when I'm in the process of writing, I'm quite unaware of those other processes that you're asking me to reflect upon. What I will say is, of course, these are the, the, the issues that have personally inflected my entire life and pretty much every cell of my being. So I have worked as hard as I could to look at them as directly as I can manage to bear. Mm. Um, I spoke a little bit about how much I love poetry, and I do. But when I was starting as a writer and people would meet me, they would often say, why aren't you writing a memoir? You know? And I thought, I, I'm obsessed with memory, just as memoir is obsessed with memory. But I need to look at things slant, as Dickinson says. So I think that's part of my answer for you as a mm -hmm. formal one, which is, this book is brutal to me. Mm -hmm. And so it was about a history that is difficult for me to talk about, and yet I felt compelled to write about it, the irony and paradox of so many writers. You want to write about the exact thorn, really. And so that's, yeah, form is the thing that for me allows us to bear feeling. And for me, by bear, I mean every iteration of that verb in English, right? To carry it, to give birth to it, as well as to endure it and survive it. Mm -hmm. So all of those are my answer to your really beautiful question um, about what comes first. I don't know. It's mm -hmm. when, when they come together, then that's when you know you're singing because there's, you can't tell where form and feeling are separated anymore. Yeah. Oh, so much to think about. Um, <laughs> and I know you've written in personas in the past before I this, sure have. this book. Uh, and just to make sure everybody knows what we mean, because it's also a craft term, yeah. poetry, would be the poem speaking in the voice of somebody who is explicitly not the poet. Yeah, and I won't give my discourse on persona today, but I will also say, you know, it comes out of many different traditions. Some of you have studied psychology or philosophy, have also studied the persona, and I mean it in those iterations as well. Um, it's the mask. It's, it's the thing you put on so that you can basically get away from yourself self ostensibly, but find that you become more yourself by putting on that mask. And so that's the idea of persona that I really like. Formally, it's a dramatic monologue. So I want to obviously be on a stage still. This is what this tells me. You know, <laughs> I once was a performing, uh, you know, aspiring performing artist, right? I love theater, dance, singing, acting. And I think that that must be really, why these poems are the way they are so often, because there's something about the fact of performativity and orality that poetry lends itself to that I think is really striking to me in terms of capturing character, tone, attitude, multiplicity of tone, not just one tone. And I'm always trying to get that into a poem. And so, you know, persona is kind of, what you said earlier, Adrian, is really wise. Um, these poems are, ab you know, about Shara, and they're not about Shara at the same time, right? Especially, I'm grateful you pointed out the Burns connection. Everybody says Isabella is me, you know? And I'm like, yeah, okay, so we bear a striking resemblance in some ways. I get it. <laughs> However, she's not me. She is born into a different century. She's been born into a different country, so no. Mm -hmm. but it's nice to hear that there's a recognition that even in Burns, who was farther away from me and harder to access, of course, there's the desire for poetry and to be a good person running throughout his section, mm -hmm. despite what he does. He wants to be good. And that's a powerful conundrum and complexity, I think, to then create a character out of. Yeah. Uh, and back to the persona, I mean, we've talked in yeah. class, and I think even this morning with you, about how the persona can be a way to uh, maybe preserve a little bit of your own space as a person, that you know, the person who's speaking is not you. But it can also be very revealing of 
your innermost thoughts. Um, exactly. When I said, like, it's a thing you think you put on so you can escape yourself, but you become more yourself. Mm -hmm. So this goes way back for me. I mean, from my first book, I just started to do this without even thinking about it, right? So a lot of my, my friends who were poets were writing narrative poems. And I love a story, but I cannot tell a story directly to save my life. I can barely answer your question without going <laughs> off on six different tangents, right? So I found that the thing that was pulling me was to constantly put on these personae. And the first time I did it, and I've been able to speak about it now, the book was published in 1999. I wrote that book when I was in my early 20s. And only now approaching, I won't say approaching 50. I like to say that because it's a nice round number. Technically, I'm going to be 49 next week. So not, can't say I'm quite 50, but I think about that like a lifetime ago girl, mm -hmm. trying to be a poet, trying to deal with some difficult subjects. And I wouldn't have been able to do it, Adrian, if I thought, for example, the Persephone poem that I first wrote, mm -hmm. if I couldn't, if I said Shara is writing about this relationship to her mother and to her mother's boyfriend, uh, who's molested her and sexually assaulted her, there is just no way I would have written that poem, I tell you now. It's taken a lifetime to say that in public. That's how old I am, guys. Because <laughs> so. I do think things have changed, and yeah. for the better, yeah. you know, for the better. Like, and I'm sure that being in a context in which things have changed also has helped old people like me say things now. Mm -hmm. But I still don't write narrative directly, mm -hmm. whatever it's worth. Yeah. So if you're writers, I know many people here are, think about what you love and just do more of it. Yeah, I mean, one way, to, that's how I like to teach art. Sure, you should identify where your weaknesses are. Um, you know, we were talking, Siobhan, about dance. I have, like, absolutely shit turnout. Sorry if you're offended by that word. Bad turnout, terrible. But you know what? I'm hyper-flexible. Do you know what I can do? I can distract your eye from the fact that I don't have turnout because my leg's going to be so high, you're not going to notice very much. Right? Not anymore. This was my former self. <laughs> but I say that because that's what it's about, realizing that, yeah, you can only work with what you're given. Everybody gets to be their own kind of artist and thinker. Then figure out what you do and do more of it. So that's the thing with monologues and personae. Mm -hmm. It started early and often, and the lyric. Every little tiny song I could write in a poem I wanted to write, so, yeah. Fantastic. I think it's time for another poem or two. Oh, is it? Okay. I believe so. <laughs> if, do you want me to choose or do you want to choose? I like you either choose. way. I like the surprise element here. Okay. Yeah. Um, I was talking about the husband in this book. Most of the time, Isabella's talking to her um, grandfather. But the poems that are addressed to her husband are decidedly about that question of what love is also looking like in this really difficult space to articulate, um, which is the power relationship in a heterosexual relationship between a man and a woman is inscribed in patriarchy. You already have one problem to contend with. Like, individuals may be loving each other, but you're inscribed inside of a social structure that dictates how you're supposed to behave to each other. You're going to have to constantly resist that if you want egalitarian love, right? But if you're a black woman and you're married to a white man, now you're also inscribed inside of race. And so I think Isabella's husband in this book, I imagine him to be an enlightened 19th century man, by which I mean he is taking his wife, his new wife, to abolitionist meetings. He's exposing her to Wollenstonecraft's work on the vindication of the rights of women, which is published before she's basically entered the world. When is the publication? 17? It's in my book. Hold on. Bad, 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 Shara. How do you not remember? Oh, I didn't put the date. Whatever. It's before, <laughs> it's before <laughs> Isabella. So she's allowed to, she's given this by him. You need to know this because she's still grappling with the question of how far does that go and what does love mean? 
So I'm going to read this poem, Husband, because I think this speaks to it, and it speaks to also all of my long obsession with and fraught engagement with romantic poetry that started way before this book, when I was um, a young writer coming out of the Enlightenment. Husband. For all the faith in argument, in principle, in reason, for all the books you hand me, bid me read, for all in the dark I pretend, for all the pursuit of equality, of righteousness and good, for all the rights of man, the vindication of woman, for all in the dark I pretend we are, for all the moral cause, abolition, the struggle for freedom, for all in the dark I pretend we are just, for all the history of heroes and foes, the victors and the vanquished, for all the talk and talk and talk, for all in the dark, I pretend we are just one soul. What would it mean to see? Not love, not truth, not beauty, but who has been in your house? Who sleeping in your bed? The capital LTB in that penultimate line, um, well, the love, not so much, but um, it's Keats I'm really grappling with there too, not just Burns at that moment. So, um, you know, if you know the ending of Ode on a Grecian Urn, right? No? Yes? Go ahead. Do you remember it? Yeah. <laughs> Vaughn. Exactly. Yep. I like audience participation. It wakes people up. <laughs> but Siobhan, I figured you knew it. So that's why I thought I could put you on the spot. Yeah, I like that. And whether, you know, Keats is saying it or the ode, is, the urn is saying it or whatever you want to do with those last lines, they haunt a lot of our dreams and thoughts about uh, the world we live in. So. Is that good, or do you want another poem? Very good. Okay. Um, I just I don't want to talk too much and not leave enough space for poems. There's we have space for your question time. So when you yes. feel like it's time, you could also tell us. Yeah, Mark. We're making sure to allow enough time, right? Oh wait, we have a little bit more. Yeah. Okay. Um, maybe I'll read. Um, a poem in Isabella's grandmother's voice. And before that, I think I'll read another poem about her first. So, like I said, when this book, when Isabella's section of the book opens, her grandmother has died. And I have long thought, and this is again, the similarities between me and Isabella, I suppose. My grandmother raised me largely, uh, brought me from Jamaica to the US. My mom is in my life still, but my father died a few days after I migrated, and my mom stayed in Jamaica. They both were still in Jamaica when I came. Um, it's not an uncommon immigrant story to come in pieces like that, and that was my story, but the difference being my father I never saw again, and my uh, mother I didn't see for a year, and it was changed when she came back. The relationship, my grandmother in a lot of ways at that point, I don't know, because I'm not in other people's heads, but you all have a grandmother who like maybe knits things for you. My grandmother does not occupy that space in my head. So <laughs> um, she was really my mother, I think, is the closest I can come to understanding how she operated for me. And I've thought about that a lot because I've thought we always think a man for a woman is the, the straight woman is, you know, the greatest love of her life or something. I think maybe sometimes it was my grandmother. That's not to give any discounting to my husband, 
who is also the great love of my life. I like everything to be superlative. I have many best friends, for example. <laughs> um, but I think my grandmother was the great love of my life, and I gave that to Isabella. Memory. My first was sound, brought forth from her hand, wielding an ax, severing the necks of fowl, rending flesh from bone that sound, torn from a throat the cry she'd made as a child rendered orphan, stolen across an ocean, hungering to feed, ceaselessly to feed. The second was no sound but fire, kindled of her hands, lighting kitchen walls, dredging blood from the sea's memory, blood tilling soil, blood not even rain that falls and falls without end, not any water we cross, any riverbed stone can absolve. And then I said I'd read one in Nancy's voice. It's the only one. She's, she is, um, to me, she's the sort of um, absent figure in this book that is throughout it a presence. And this is the only time she speaks from, from the other world. And while Isabella is dealing with her grief and her question about passing um, and whether to tell her husband the truth, um, she's having this kind of breakdown in a way of the dissolution between dream and waking and between memory that is hers and memory that is not hers. So the memory of the Middle Passage is coming to Isabella, etc. That helps you to give some sense of the milieu, the permeability between the world of the dead and the living that this poem is supposed to occupy. Um, So this is her grandmother speaking, and Duppy is the Jamaican word for ghost. At the hour of Duppy and dream, Miss Nancy speaks. And the you, sorry, is Isabella. She's addressing her. You think what lies before you asks more than you can bear. But I am with you now as I was when you came into this world, your one eye looking forward, the other forever looking back. From the netherworld, you were flung into this one, squalling full of that scent we could not wash away. Your mother's breath extinguished as you gulped your first the call swaddling your face till we lifted it, unveiling, beholding the unasked for, girl child cast down in a place of stone, of men who cannot see to see, do not hear what needs listening. Men who have riven borders and nations, and you in whom the rift has opened. Hear me, for I was there in the beginning. Witness as you entered, as you came dusking, tearing all asunder, rending the fabric they call truth. I'm so glad we get to hear from Nancy, because she's the person I'm always thinking of as while well, I'm reading everyone else's voice mm-hmm. here, uh, because she's really the beginning of the book. She's in the beginning. She's throughout, yeah. Um, yeah, she's a really complex figure in this book for me, um, from, because she's powerful, basically. I dislike the narratives of slavery that suggest that the enslaved were powerless entirely. Um, just, I don't believe in it. I've watched, in Jamaica we have an expression for women. I'm, I'm the tallest in my family and I'm also wearing these. They're very comfortable <laughs> and they give me some height. But I'm like barely 5'4 and I'm on the tall side. My grandmother was below five feet by the end of her life and we have an expression that says she little bit but she talawa. 
meaning like she might seem small, but she is fierce. And that's what I know. That's the world I know. And so, and I just wanted Nancy to be that. Not just, of course she's enslaved, but she is powerful. And so that's why she's a force so much in this work throughout. Mm -hmm. um, even in the, she has the power to refuse burns and does. She frightens Douglas, basically. She's that kind of African woman who, you know, in Jamaica, Obia is a belief system, and she becomes basically a complete practitioner, artist when it comes to that. She learns how to create abortions. She's super powerful force. And there were lots of African women like her on the plantations. So, you know, all of these figures, they're drawn partly from ancestral memory and stories, but they're also drawn from history, mm -hmm. except I can't find this in the history books, right? So that's also why I think Isabella mm -hmm. is here and why Nancy is here, is this is the history that's not existing that I am made of, that the only way to, to write it is in a way creatively, you know? Um, so that's kind of going into the direction of the research question of this book. But the question I'm trying to answer over and over again are the questions. They're ones where the limits epistemologically for history fail. The way we understand history, the way we, we, we understand it construct, it's constructed, why do we have the stories we have and not others? Because who gets to save their materials for us to examine decades and generations and hundreds of years later? And if your materials aren't there to be examined, then you are written out of the annals of history. Yeah? So, anyway, I'm rambling. I'm stopping. You're not now. rambling. You're doing what we asked you to come do. It's wonderful. <laughs> um, I have one more, another question about maybe, maybe a larger ranging question about you as a poet. Okay. Um, it's clear that you've been navigating the way English is spoken in many different countries. Yeah. Um, obviously, Jamaica, Scotland, England. You were living in London when this all began. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. And Pennsylvania. Right? That's not a country, I realize. No, but it has a, di <laughs> but it has a different and identifiable syntax for me after 18 years of living here. Absolutely. Um, the completion of the verb without the to be tells me I'm in Pennsylvania. <laughs> right. <laughs> Needs fixed. I know I'm in Central PA now. Yep. So do all those different Englishes, when they collide or when you go from one to another, do things to your imagination? Of course, because I love um, song and I love language for its sound, and it's fascinating to me the compression of insight that comes through sound and syntax, and so an idiom. You know, much is lost, it feels for me, by the, in a lot of ways I'm writing books to try to like reclaim and bring back these fragments of language that I want restored. As much as I want the past restored, I want the language to come back too. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I don't want it restored in the way it was. I want to get to reassemble it. <laughs> So I should be quite clear about that, um, you know. Um, but yeah, I think language is um, endlessly fascinating for its etymology. It's, in, it's it, uh, the example I gave was just this week after all this time of researching this book, spending in Scotland. Um, my husband said to me, "Hey, don't you think it's really funny that the pepper that defines he's an American, the the food you eat, the Scotch bonnet." You always just say it like one word, scotch bonnet. And he's like, don't you think that's kind of funny? It's scotch bonnet, and it looks like a bonnet? <laughs> like, like the Scots tam? And I was like, huh. I've used that my entire life and not thought about it until that moment, right? But that's how language is like, we accept whatever world we are born into as our language, but there's all these layers of history inside of the words and those turns of phrases. So the more I can bring those back, the more I can layer these, these migrations, mm -hmm. basically, um, forced and chosen alike. 
I'm not sure how much I feel about the chosen because that hasn't been my experience. Mm -hmm. Most of the time in human history, people were forced one way or another to migrate. In 21st century world, who knows, because of COVID, things are shifting again. But globalization's promise was that we could just go everywhere, right, without consequence. But yet, all of the migrations of human civilization have shown consequence of one sort or another. Mm -hmm. So that's moving away from language now back to history. But for me, they're wedded and implicated in one another. So maybe I'll close since I'd like to abide by our timetable and leave question time with the last poem in the book, since Adrian kindly suggested that there's this arc with Burns and Isabella's section, but then I open and close it. Um, so after I've said the dead will never speak and then I make them speak, <laughs> <laughs> this is the last poem. No ruin stone, for my grandmother. When the dead return, they will come to you in dream. And in waking will be the bird knocking, knocking against glass, seeking a way in. Will masquerade as the wind, its voice made audible by the tongues of leaves greedily lapping as the waves self-made fugue is a turning and returning the dead will not then nor ever again desert you their unrest will be the coat cloaking you the farther you journey from them the more Distance will maw in you, time and place gulching when the dead return to demand accounting. Wanting and wanting and wanting everything you have to give and nothing will quench or unhunger them as they take all you make as offering, then tell you to begin again. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you. It is now time for the question answer session. Uh, before you ask your question, please wait for the microphone to reach you. We reserve the first question for students, and then we will open it up to the rest of the audience. We will now take the first question. Hi, thank you so much for tonight. Um, I'm so excited to read this book. Um, I just wanted to hear more about your journey as a poet and as an artist. Um, and I love to hear that you have these backgrounds in different art forms, and I was wondering how that worked into your work now. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna thank you for your kind comments, by the way, and for being here. Um, I'm gonna direct this specifically to students, and everyone else, just re rewind the years and come along with me. Um, I went to university after giving up art. I am from a family where I was the first person to go to college. I was an odd child who liked books, but I had no aspiration of being a writer, didn't know somebody could be one. I say this because the reason I practiced art, and Siobhan and I spoke about this, because I was very lucky to go to a public school in Miami that had a robust art program. And I received outstanding training free, like in that institution, you know? So that was a gift to me, but I was struggling the whole time with my background, really, and the weight of it, which is, I, if I was going to do this, was basically a wastrel in the scheme of things. I was going to maybe live under a bridge and not eat, for one thing. 
but also squander the opportunity. My grandfather constantly said, you have the brains to do medicine, you must do medicine. Not in that voice, I don't know where that voice came from. <laughs> um, but essentially, that was the expectation I labored under. So art was the thing that I loved in various forms, but felt there was no place in my life for it. When I went to university then, I was going to become a serious person now. So I was pre-med, and what happened was that I had taken, as many of you have, I'm sure, these AP classes where you don't have to take like some of the first year courses, right? So I was in like calculus and biology, whatever, chemistry, you know, all the lovely, some of you, they're lovely, and, and they were interesting. I don't mean to downplay them. <laughs> but um, what I found interesting looking back is I was able to sign up for a survey in the British Romantic Poets that first semester as a first year student because I didn't need the other requirement. Well, as it turns out, I just kept reading that instead of the other subjects that I was really supposed to be paying attention to <laughs> as a pre-med student. And I mean, I paid enough attention to do fine, but after a year, I then signed up for the early romantics after that course as a separate course. Then I signed up for the late romantics as a separate course. You know, I had like an undergrad like minor in the romantic poets developing, you know, specifically John Keats. Um, and it was one of those things that just kept happening. So the question is not how I became a poet, but how does art impact each of you? I would turn that back on you as my answer. And is it something you can make space in your life for? You know? Um, and no matter if you become a poet, I think once our basic needs are satisfied, once we have shelter, safety, food, art, I think, is what makes sense for us. It's what helps us to make sense of the world and why we're here. But art, you know, like safety, shelter, food, those are super important. <laughs> Hi, Shara. It's um, lovely to see you again and you wonderful too. to hear your work. Um, I'm really looking forward to reading this book, and so I can't speak to the other poems in it besides the ones I heard you read. Mm -hmm. But I kept noticing moments in a number of the poems, especially the first Burns poem mm -hmm. and the poem in Nancy's voice, where there are um, vistas referenced in some way, an act of looking out on something mm -hmm. or beholding something right. or taking a sight in and then meditating on that. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to what extent maybe those kinds of vistas or that act of, of looking or beholding mm. recurs in this collection and maybe how it speaks to um, some of the central questions the book examines, especially in relation to, to acts of seeing and reckoning with or of moving towards or away from right. something. That's a great question. It's great to see you again, too. I would say it's um, partly because in our language, we use sight in many ways. We use it to mean the eye, you know, the, the act of light hitting the cornea, and for those of us who are sighted and being able to assemble the world or a simulacrum of it. But more often, we use it in the figurative sense. Insight, wisdom, truth, those things. So I'm sort of really obsessed with this idea of where is sight occurring for each of these characters and history and moments in history, but also where is their blindness? Where are these spots that they are all missing? You know? And so those are, my answer is that yes, it's about sight, but it's also about what's not being seen by them. That I'm inviting us who have knowledge that actually Burns and Isabella do not have to, through irony, right? Dramatic irony specifically, I'm inviting us to look at them and see even Isabella, where is she missing it? It's our hubris that makes us believe our age is the superior one and that each of us individually have evolved. We're so evolved, we couldn't possibly have any of those blindnesses other people do. 
I think that's our narcissism and myopia personally. So I'm trying to construct a world where that tension is in play. Thank you, it's a great question. Yeah, I was just going to ask if you could talk a little bit about your relationship with Burns and his work before mm -hmm. you found out a little bit about his past and maybe how he inspired some of your earlier or even kind of mid-career work and how finding out about his history and his past impacted your relationship and how you interacted with his work. Yeah, in fact. that's a very good question. So the 17-year-old who went to university um, loved the romantic poets, and Burns is a romantic poet. So I cannot remember, because Keats saturated my sight um, so fully. I hated all the others in comparison. Um, and so <laughs> I'm kind of like that, unfortunately. I become sort of obsessed with things. And so, I, I mean, I read them all, so I know I read Burns too. But actually, in all honesty, he didn't stay with me until 2015, all those decades later, and I am in London and I go to Scotland, so this is a story to answer your question. And um, all my life, um, because, and I had said this to the class, I think, I don't know what I look like to people. I've tried to guess, um, but I can't quite be sure because different people seem to look at me and see almost like shape-shifting in front of them. They see me differently. Particularly once they know my ancestry, it starts to happen. I've witnessed that my whole life. I've also witnessed people just assuming I'm white, and then I have this last name, McCallum, so the next question out of their mouth is often, hmm, kind of hear an accent slightly coming out of this woman, and her last name is McCallum. Let me go out on a limb and guess that she's Scottish, right? And that's happened over and over again. And then I have to decide in that moment, and I'm trying to just check out of Target, how <laughs> am I supposed to explain my history, all of history, race, genetics, in the most succinct fashion possible <laughs> so I can just keep going, right? Or am I just gonna casually pass, really? You know, so this is a fraught question I've dealt with, and I think that's the answer, really, is, I was on a collision course with Scotland and Burns without knowing it, and once it happened, I couldn't stop thinking about that question. Why do people keep asking me if I'm Scottish again? You know, and I have to say, well, my name is patrilineal, my father's father was black Jamaican. If I'm Scottish, I'm not sure it's the way you're imagining, like it was like a rote kind of answer I had rehearsed. And I realized at that point, but wait a second, you have all this language in Jamaican English that's Scottish. Half of the, a third of the phone book in Kingston are like Campbell. <laughs> you know? Like what? So I started to dig into this. And of course then Burns came back. I had memory of O to a Mouse in particular. O to a Mouse is like tragically reimagined in this book a lot, if you know that poem. Um, because I loved it. I also love his, his song, A Fond Kiss. If I can give you a gift today, earlier I told the students, Cassandra Wilson, Love is Blindness. Also, I'm giving that to all of you. Um, but also, A Fond Kiss by Eddie Reader. Look it up on YouTube. You will be so thankful. Anything else you forget about tonight, it's fine, <laughs> okay? Um, I loved it, so of course I had to recast it and grapple with it. So that's what happened with Burns. It's like, you know, you love a thing so much, and then Rebecca, I mean, you were speaking to this, I think, the, the, the art by these progenitors, that you love their work, and then you find out this part about who they were, and all of a sudden, like, over and over again, you have to reckon with, like, oh, they would never have seen me. Like, oh, I think I'm an artist in their tradition. This is the problem. I think I'm an artist in their tradition, right? I have many traditions, but I'm like, sure, I read the heck out of the British romantics. Of course, that's part of my tradition as a poet, right? And then you realize, like, no, you're not seen. So that's Burns. I hope that's clear. Yeah, okay. 
Maybe I wanted him to see me. I don't know. Mariana. This is my daughter's explanation for this book. She said, you go to such lengths to try to explain this book, Mother. Just tell people you became obsessed with Robert Burns and you wrote fan fiction in which you're his granddaughter. <laughs> so, that's my, my daughter's summary for you. <laughs> That's lovely. I think everyone needs a party line sometimes. So thank you so much for all of these thoughts. And the question I have is more a rumination. It will probably sound like it's coming out of left field, and that's, that's my specialty. Um, I am just hearing you talk about history in ways that really are not um, limited to Jamaica, of course, and plantation history there. As yeah. a Caribbean scholar, I have to ask you whether No Ruined Stone may have resonance with Sans Souci, the palace of um, Henri Christophe in Haiti. Is there any resonance with the Haitian Revolution and its legacy in this broader I guess, landscape that you're talking mm -hmm. in. And mm -hmm. I have to admit, when I saw your title for tonight, I got really excited and I thought about Nicolas Guillen in Cuba, who wrote about 200 pages of history, the stone that no one, the stone of a page that no one turns. And I just wonder, given Haiti and Jamaica's very close history. Of course. An entangled yeah, experience. Is there any room for thinking about that in the larger context of your work? I love that you asked that question, and I love that I get to respond with a poem. <laughs> Augur. Recent unrest in Haiti, renewed fervor for abolition back home, give rise to Douglas's widening spell of dread. Awakening to the end encroaching, he holds all at Springbank hostage to his unpredictable, eruptible moods. Mornings, making my way to the fields, I must pass the kitchen. And she is always there, the child at her side, uncommonly fair and growing willful, all the more like her mother, who senses my gaze but will not countenance it. This act of petition and refusal we replay as day gives way to day and Douglas sputters over a bit of errant flour or sugar, tearing about in mindless rage. Unmoving, she wields silence in her body like an ax her body no longer yielding the sweetness of the girl I knew. The other slaves whisper of what she's turned into. Obia woman claiming dominion over life and death, crooking out for herself and that child, undue position in the house. Jealousy is currency amongst the slaves. Yet in times of need, the girls and women have no choice but to seek her. Douglas knows why there are fewer and fewer births each passing year. He hears the scuttling chatter that augurs truth. But facing Nancy, even he falls mute. Like all, he fiercely fears whatever he cannot rule, nor can. So I start with the Haitian Revolution deliberately, because in the context of the Caribbean, as you're pointing out, it was widespread in what it did to continue to inspire slaves to fight for freedom. Um, for those of you who don't know, Haiti is the first black republic in the New World, um, and it's, it's really a model um, for so many other enslaved peoples. There were also lots of instances in Jamaica's history 
of slave rebellions throughout the entire time slavery is happening. It's not as if Africans said, you know, Jamaicans who are not yet Jamaicans. It's, you know, it doesn't exist really, the nation state as, as we understand it at that time. Um, but they're not just laying down and taking this, right? So I really encoded in that poem and in other poems too, the Haitian Revolution, uh, the history of the Maroons in Jamaica, the figure of Nanny of the Maroons is in this book. So there's so much of that history I was trying, Mariana, to speak to, because it is pan-Caribbean, it is also transnational, and I like that you point that out, that this book is located in multiple temporal spaces, but also geographic spaces. And understand, like, the Jamaica I'm born into in 72, even to say, you know, it's 10 years old as an independent nation when I'm born. You know, so all of that's really interesting to me when we think about history, is to understand the differences between moments people enter into this timeline that we're, we're occupying. We have time for one more question. Thank you, Shara and Adrian. It's been a really fascinating conversation. Um, I wanted to ask about the first poem you read, and if I recall correctly, and that's very possibly I'm not, but I think I um, heard the voice ask of Robert Burns, what am I doing here? And I heard that here, I took that to, to be you, referring to the kind of con constructed geography of, of the collection that you're in the process of creating. And so my, my question is if, if that makes any sense to you as in, in, in the context of, of your creative art. And if so, if that kind of imaginative geography for you is more a looking out or a looking in. Mm -hmm. So I will say I love that reading, Mark. Love it. Um, there's, there's so many answers to the question, so I'll start with the most basic. I wrote the poem in Scotland, and I literally was on his doorstep. I went to Ayrshire, where he was born, and traced his life. I spent two weeks traveling and basically went everywhere he ever was. But. I also think my whole life I'm interested in the second part of what you've said, which is here is a constructed space. In poetry, for me, it's always elegiac, it's always memory. It's meaning to say, for example, I've written about Jamaica a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. The Jamaica I write about does not exist, except in my memory, and in the writing. And that's why I keep obsessively writing about it in a way. As I said, with language, I'm always trying to hold on to it. It's like I'm trying to, I'm trying to defy death and time, basically, as a writer. I don't know how else to put it. Like, I, I want not to have them have the last say, you know? So the only way I can resurrect my dead is as a writer to bring them back and have them speak and that means to say that the here is all these different temporal moments collaged. All these geographies collaged, yeah. It's such a good reading. Much better than my very, very mundane, I went to Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to um, continue. Anyone who wants to chat, feel free to come and speak with me. And again, thank you all so much for being here and Mark and everyone at the Clark Forum, Adrian, Yashara. This was really, really brilliant to be part of this evening with all you. Thank you.